Focusing on the promises of God in Isaiah concerning Yahweh being the one true God, uh, we've also been looking at the tension in the Bible between Satan and God, uh, this created being, this angel-turned-demon Satan, and how he's always trying to uh, counterfeit, create a counterfeit system that men can adhere to rather than simply learning God and, and imitating God. Tonight I want to at least start, we can probably finish this, but I want to at least start showing uh, how this war between Satan and God played out in the very, very early history of Israel. I told you that there has been a war, uh, that, that Satan had a war with God, uh, with the Egyptian gods that he brought up, the pantheon of Egyptian gods. Later, Israel would leave Egypt. They'd go into Babylon, into Canaan, and there uh, Satan had all these Canaanite gods. Uh, same gods, different names, God of the sun, God of this, God of fertility, God of love, goddess of this. Uh, just the names changed, but the Canaanites took over. Later, the Assyrians would have their own gods to tempt Israel with. The Babylonians would come after that with their own gods. And so tonight I want to start this uh, Yahweh versus the Egyptian gods of Satan. I want to talk about the fact that Satan had a whole cadre of false gods in Egypt that human beings were worshiping in place of Yahweh to show that tension and just how it is that God showed his, his uh, supremacy over all these false gods, that he is the one true God, and he clearly did that in Egypt. So how did the Jews, first question is, how did the Jews get to Egypt in the first place? We have to look at a bit of history, a bit of Egyptian history. And so we know not just that Israel left Egypt, but we need to know how they got in there. At least review this again. And this is how they got there. Who's this? Who's this a picture of? I mean, I know you have to be imaginative. Let me just tell you, those are traitors. Those are businessmen, traitors on the camels, the one holding the boy, uh, in the rope is also a traitor, and the boy's name is Joseph. Joseph, sold to the Ishmaelites, the Midianite traders, uh, and taken down to Egypt. But we have to back up a step before that and say, why, uh, why did this occur? What was going on in Israel that one of Jacob's 12 sons was carted off, sold, into Egyptian slavery. How did this occur? What was going on in Israel that Yahweh sent them into Egypt in the first place? This picture right here may, be, may look like a picture of captivity. This is a picture of salvation. If God had not taken uh, the sons of Israel into Egypt, they would have destroyed themselves. They were on a destructive path, a self-destructive path in the land of Canaan. The 12 sons of Jacob were destroying their godly heritage. They were destroying uh, the 12 tribes, the nation of Israel. Had Yahweh not stepped in and taken Joseph into Egypt, uh, there probably wouldn't be a nation of Israel. Now, the line of the seed of Jesus Christ would have been pinched. And I'll tell you why I say that. Joseph was sold uh, by his 12 brothers, the tribe, the, the sons of Jacob. Remember, it, uh, Abraham was the first Jew called out. He had a son named Isaac, and Isaac had twins, Jacob and Esau. Jacob had 12 sons. And those are the 12 boys that became the tribes of Israel. Every time we see that map of Israel, you see uh, uh, the names Gad and Reuben and Manasseh and all these names, Judah, Simeon, Levi, etc. Uh, those were the sons of Jacob. And they would become the fathers of these larger and larger families and clans and tribes until eventually they would number like the sand of the seashore, innumerable, the Jewish 12 tribes. Well, it was of those 12 brothers that several of them took their brother Joseph here because his father Jacob loved him and made no mistake about it. Made, made, he didn't hide that fact that he loved his son Joseph. He Remember, he made him that, uh, that multicolored coat, that multicolored tunic that Joseph wore. Well, his brothers were jealous of him. 
And so his brother sold him to traitors. This is simply a, a, some sort of depiction, a movie or something. They sold him to Midianite traitors. They meant it for evil. Later, what did Joseph say to, their, to his brothers many years later when they would come into Egypt and they saw this boy grown up? Joseph told them, you meant it for evil, but God what? What is the rest of that phrase? You sold me because you hated me and you wanted me destroyed. You went back to my father and lied about where I was and made my father think I was dead. It was out of the evil of your hearts that you did this. But God, God intended this for it to occur. God meant it for good. And it was through this, Joseph says, that Israel was saved through the fact that he was sold into slavery and went into Egypt. So we see J Jacob's sons, the 12 tribes of Israel, they were destroying themselves. And so Yahweh had to send them into Egypt to, to save them from themselves so that they could grow in number, they could grow in maturity, etc. Uh, so, so we see Yahweh step into the picture. Excuse me for looking at these notes. I'm trying real hard not to put these glasses on. Uh, again, uh, there's no question, and I'm going to give you an example in just a minute. There's no question when you read the pages of Genesis that if Yahweh hadn't stepped in and saved the men from themselves, they likely would have destroyed themselves from within. They didn't need an enemy to destroy themselves. They were living in such a way so far away from God, and I'll give you an example. They were living so far away from God uh, that uh, Yahweh had to step in and send Joseph to Egypt. God meant this for good. He knew His plan. He knew the, the souls of these men, uh, the Israelites, and He knew He had to save them. One example. One example. Uh, and this story, by the way, is found in Genesis chapter 38, the story of, of uh, Joseph being sold by his brothers. In the very next chapter, in Genesis chapter 39, if you want to turn to it, please do. Uh, I'm going to read you certain passages from it. I'm going to tell you the story. I'm going to tell you the story of the fourth son of, uh, of Jacob. His name was Judah. And I'm just going to highlight some of the facts in Judah's adult life to show you that these boys were destroying themselves, recklessly living recklessly living, destroying their godly heritage. And not only that, more tragically, coming very close to destroying the line of the seed of Jesus Christ. Now, when I mention the name Judah, uh, you all know what tribe Jesus Christ came from. What tribe was it? Of which of the 12 sons of Israel did Jesus come through? It was the tribe of Judah. And look at the example, uh, look at the example that I show you of Judah, what he was doing. Jesus Christ's great, 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 however many greats grandfather. This is what Jesus' grandfather Judah was doing about the time that God, in his mind, was saving Israel by sending this boy into Egypt. The very first thing you see in chapter 38 is that he married a Canaanite woman named Shua. He intermarried. The Jews were to remain distinct. They were to marry within their tribe, certainly within their people, Israel. And what we see of this grandfather of Jesus very early is that he would intermarry with the Canaanite woman. Wrong. That's against the rules of Yahweh. That's wrong. The next thing he has with this woman, not only does he marry her, but he has three sons with this lady. I'm trying to paint the picture for you of exactly why God had to send Israel to Egypt in the first place, it was Israeli error. So the three sons of, of, uh, of uh, Judah were Er, Onan, and, and Shelah. And what we read about the sons of Judah, when you think about what kind of father he may have been, uh, two of these men are so evil that God kills them himself. Uh, what we see in the oldest son, Er, is that he would also marry a Canaanite woman. Not a Jewish woman, but a Canaanite woman named Tamar, a Gentile. Look at what it says in the Bible after their marriage. It says in Genesis 38, 7, But Er, this first son, this eldest son of Judah, but Er, Judah's firstborn, was evil in the sight of Yahweh, so Yahweh took his life. 
That was ju- this is, this is the, the potential line of the seed of Jesus Christ. This is his grandfather we're talking about. This is his grandfather's family, and the firstborn son of his grandfather's family is so evil in the sight of the Lord that God takes him. You go on in the story and you see that the, uh, this will leave, the death of her husband will leave this woman, Tamar, a widow in need of someone to have a child with her, a brother of Er would have to have a child with her so that, so that Er could have a, a descendant, someone to keep his family name going. So who do you turn to in Israel for that? You turn to the brother of the deceased. So you turn to the second son, Onan. And Onan was tasked by his father, go into your sister-in-law Tamar. We're talking about sexual relations. Go into her, impregnate her, so that her firstborn son will carry on the name of your dead brother heir. That is leveret marriage. That's what's going on. So what happens is the brother Onan will go into his sister-in-law Tamar, And he will enjoy the pleasures of the encounters. I don't have to say any more. We know what he's going into her room for. He will enjoy the pleasures of the encounters like a lascivious, lawless man. But he will not impregnate her. You can read the words in the scripture of what he did uh, in his own choice. He did this over and over. It's a a present tense idea. He would go into her very... um, very often, I'm sure his father thought he was trying to impregnate her, and shucks, it's just not working. She can't get pregnant. And that's not the story. This boy was evil. So what do we see about Onan in Genesis 38:10? Because of what he was doing, having this illicit affair with the sister-in-law and not trying to get her pregnant, which is what God would have wanted. Look what happens to him. He did what was evil, uh, but he... But what he did, excuse me, was displeasing in the sight of Yahweh. So what does Yahweh do to Judah's second son? So Yahweh took his life also. We're talking about the family heritage of our Savior, Jesus Christ. This is what Israel was doing. I picked Judah because he should be the greatest of all of them. The kings of Israel would come from Judah. This is David's ancestor. Judah. Yahweh had to step in. This family was a disaster. You talk about a dysfunctional family. The 12 sons of Israel hated their brother, sold him into slavery. They wanted to murder him, except Judah said, hey, let's not murder him. Let's make a few bucks and sell him to the Midianites instead. We can make some money on this deal. That was Judah who came up with that idea. At least he saved his brother's life, but my goodness. Let's sell him and make some money. This is Judah. This is the line of the seed of Jesus Christ. So his first son was so evil that he took him. Judah's second son is so evil that God took him. What happens now? In the story, Judah will tell a lie to his daughter-in-law. Now the daughter-in-law has one brother-in-law. His name is what? uh, What was it? God, these eyes. I'm trying hard to be able to read without them. Shelah, that's what I thought, Shelah. One younger brother to her deceased husband. So Judah, her father-in-law, will lie to her and say, listen, stick around, and when Shelah gets old enough, I'll give you Shelah, and he can impregnate you to carry on your dead husband's name, uh, her name, Leverett marriage again. But that was a lie. Because when Shelah got old enough, Tamar realized that Judah wasn't giving the son to her. Judah wasn't giving her this son in marriage so that she could continue her husband's name. So not only, is, not only does he have all these other problems, the man is a consistent liar in the Bible. Several lies come out of this boy's mouth, the grandfather of Jesus Christ. So once Shelah grows up, Judah has promised Tamar that he will give him to her, but he does not. So what does Tamar have to do but take matters into her own hands? And so what Tamar decides to do is dress up as a prostitute. Listen to all the sexual sin in this, by the way. Listen to all the sexual sin in this story. It was a disaster. They were, they were destroying themselves. Tamar decides, listen, I'm going to dress up as a prostitute. 
I wonder what she knows. What would a daughter-in-law have to know about her father-in-law to know if I dress up as a prostitute and put myself in his path, he will come into me. He will pay me for the services of a prostitute. What do you have to know about your father-in-law to come up with this plan? She knew it. That's, that's who this man Judah is. She knew that this would work. So in the story, Judah's wife dies. And after the period of uh, mourning his wife, he takes a trip. He's got sheep shearers down in Timnah in the southern parts of Israel. And he takes a trip down there and his camouflaged daughter-in-law, she's camouflaged as a prostitute, is along the path of his trip to Timnah. So what does he do? The grandfather of Jesus Christ. He sees the prostitute. They make a deal for one goat. I go into you. I go into your room and, and we have uh, what a man and a prostitute has. This is the grandfather of Jesus Christ. This is the early, uh, the early family of Israel destroying itself. And so that's exactly what he does for the price of one goat. She sells herself to her father-in-law so that he can get her pregnant and she can raise that boy under the name of Er, her, her uh, deceased husband. So Judah goes into her. Uh, she gets pregnant. And the story continues. But I think that's enough of the story. It's a disaster. The 12 boys, the 12 sons of Israel are a disaster. And if Yahweh doesn't step in, they are going to just implode. They are going to destroy the nation of Israel. There will be no nation of Israel if Yahweh doesn't uh, step into this situation personally. And so he does. And he sends Joseph into Egypt. Uh, almost like an incubator, almost like you would take a, a, a child that's not old enough to live on its own, a premature child, and put it in an incubator in a hospital. Egypt was like an incubator to the immature souls of the Jewish family, the family of Jacob. He incubated them there. He protected them from themselves. Uh, we could talk a lot about what God did and how Israel lived in Egypt, but make no mistake, He kept them from destroying themselves here. And that's, what ha that's what's happening here uh, in this story uh, from this family, Judah, that the kings of Israel and even Jesus Christ, the king of kings, would come from. This should have been the best son. This is the one God chose to be the father of the kings. This should have been the most obedient son. And as we've seen, uh, he was not, and neither were his kids. Four centuries would go by, 430 years would go by from the time that we saw the picture of Joseph in a rope being led down to Egypt. 430 years would go by uh, since Joseph first entered Egypt and God delivered the Israelites from their bondage in Egypt finally. 430 years. He kept them in the incubator for 430 years. Kept them distinct from the Egyptians. You know why they were distinct from the Egyptians? Why they didn't live amongst the Egyptians? Why they didn't eat with the Egyptians? Because the Egyptians couldn't stand the Jews and their practices. The Bible says it. It was deplorable for the Egyptians to eat in a room with the Jews. We see that in this story in Joseph's life. So God saved Israel from herself. Had had, again, had Yad, Yahweh chosen not to go, uh, not to send Israel into Egypt, all would have been lost. But look now as we, as we switch gears, I tell you that's why Israel is in Egypt. That's why, because of who they were and what they were doing. And 430 years go by and God says, that's enough. I'm calling my son out of Israel, uh, out of Egypt. I'm calling Israel to go back to the land of Canaan, and I am going to destroy the pagan gods of Egypt. You might say, Rick, what does this have to do uh, with Satan? I'm going to show you now. 
all the pagan gods of Egypt. So Yahweh will appear to Moses before we get that. Yahweh put, will appear to Moses 430 years later with the decree to Moses, it's time to let my people go. I'm going to send you to Pharaoh. Look what he says in Exodus chapter 3. Uh, verse 10, therefore come now, this is Yahweh, God Himself, speaking at the burning bush, through this burning bush to Moses. He says, therefore come now and I will send you to Pharaoh so that you, Moses, may bring my people, the sons of Israel, out of Egypt. It was my idea that they go in. It's been 430 years. They can survive out here without destroying themselves, uh, just barely. So it's time to bring them out of Egypt. It's also in Exodus 3 where we get this great saying. I just have to, I can't pass it by without, without reading it to you. It's in Exodus 3.14 where God gives us the name Yahweh. Moses says to God, when God tells Moses, go to Pharaoh, go to Israel, tell the Jews that I sent you with this message that it's time to leave Egypt. And Moses says to God, behold, I'm going to the sons of Israel... And I'll say to them, the God of your fathers has sent me to you. Now they may say to me, what is his name and what shall I say to them? Moses is asking God, tell me your name so that when they ask, by whose authority are you doing these things? I can say, I can give them your name. Moses asks for a name and Yahweh responds. He gives them a name. What is his name? What shall I say to them? And God said to Moses, I am who I am. And, Mo and, and God also says, thus you shall say to the sons of Israel, I am has sent me to you. And this is where we get the word Yahweh from. I am is the Hebrew verb ehye. God saying, I am. I'm the ever-present one. It's not that I was. It's not that I will be. It's that I am. And anytime you consider God, it's always I am. He's always there, always has been, always will be, ever-present. He is the great I am. And that's what he named himself. Again, God looks down to earth and says, I am. We look up to God and say, you are Yahweh. He who is, is what Yahweh means. He who is. We get it from that beautiful verse right there. Again, you may be asking, what does this have to do with uh, Satan and Yahweh? This is what it has to do. When God was ready to pull e uh, Israel out of Egypt, look what He said. In Exodus 12, verse 12, He tells Moses, For I will go through the land of Egypt on that night. And I will strike down all the firstborn in the land of Egypt, both man and beast. This is the last plague, plague number 10. And this is God's word to Moses. I will strike down the firstborn in the land of Egypt, both man, both man and beast. And not only man and beast, but behind the scenes, what's really going on here is I will strike down all the gods of Egypt. I will be against all the gods of Egypt and I will execute judgments. I am the Lord. Where do these false gods come from? Satan. They're satanically driven. They're satanically presented. They're made in the minds of Satan and in the, mind, the minds of men hold on to them and worship them. And God makes clear, when I pull Israel out of Egypt... Part of the reason I'm doing it is to show everyone that I am God and all this pantheon of gods in Egypt are false. I'm going to destroy every one of them. I'm against all the gods of Egypt and I will execute judgments. It, was just, it just wasn't about freedom for Israel. It was about this tension, this continuing tension between Satan and God. Satan saying, look at all these Egyptians. I've got them worshiping Amun Re, the sun god, and Hotep, and all these different gods. And God says, I'm going to do something about that. I'm going to go show the Egyptians that I am God and there is no God besides me. In ten plagues, I'm going to show them. So here we have God saying, and the focus coming into focus, that this is an issue between God and the satanic gods, little g, satanic gods of Egypt. Yahweh isn't only interested in freeing Israel from the Egyptians. He's also interested in freeing the Egyptians from their bondage to Satan's false gods. Have you ever considered that? I know I've taught it, but you may not remember it. God is not only interested in freeing the Jews, 
He's also interested in freeing the Egyptians from their bondage to all these false gods, all this idolatry. And I know that because 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 3 and 4 says, This is good. I can't tell you what's good and acceptable. It doesn't matter here. It's the second part of the verse that matters. This is good and acceptable in the sight of God our Savior, this God who desires all men to be saved. And to come to the knowledge of the truth. God has a heart not just for the Jews to be saved from, Israel, or from Egypt. He also has a heart for the Egyptians to turn away from their idols and to accept the one true God for what He is. The, the creator of the world and their creator. So He wasn't only interested in saving Israel from Egypt. He was also interested in the Egyptians. He was breaking down, one at a time, their pantheon of gods through the plagues. So when bringing an end to the plague of frogs, the plague of frogs was one of the plagues. It was the second plague. And when God was bringing an end to the plague of frogs, look what Moses told Pharaoh. This continues. God tells Moses... I am going to destroy all of their gods. And when, uh, when Moses is speaking to Pharaoh, Pharaoh says, Please, Moses, pray to God to take these frogs away. And, and Moses says, Tell me what time you want him to do it. You tell me at what time you want Yahweh, the only true God, to take the frogs away. And I'll ask him to do it at that time. And so Moses gives him a time, and this, or Pharaoh gives Moses a time, and this is what Moses says. Then Moses said, tomorrow. I mean, Pharaoh says, tomorrow. So Moses says, may it be according to your word. God will take the frogs away tomorrow, just as you request. And there's a reason why. So that you may know, Pharaoh, even Pharaoh, so that you may know, you man made in the image and likeness of God himself, you valuable creature of God, so that you, Pharaoh, may know that there is no one like Yahweh our God. There is no one like Yahweh our God, not all of your, uh, not all of your gods of Egypt. And God will do this at the precise time you ask for it to show you that He exists and none of your gods do. Yahweh versus the Egyptian gods of Satan. Just a quick chart here. Yahweh versus the Egyptian gods of Satan. He said he's going to beat them all in the plagues. I'm just going to show you a few of these. I think there's six of them. I'm just going to show you a few of the plagues. I hope you can read it. And show you the God that was attached to them, that God was attacking, executing judgment on the false Egyptian gods. The first... Uh, if you'll remember, the first plague was that God would turn the Nile River into blood. And He did. And the God of Egypt that God was fighting against, that He was executing judgments against, that He was showing His superiority over, that He was showing His power over, that God, Yahweh, is the only God, and this God is nothing not even a god, was this god Hopi, the god of the Nile River. There was a god of the Nile River that the Egyptians worshipped, and Yahweh said, I'm going to take him down, I'm going to take his river and turn it into a flow of blood. Where's your god? Where's the power of your god Hopi? If I can take his river and turn it into a flow of blood, who's superior? Yahweh is. Also in that... Uh, first plague, all the fish in the river die. The fish in the river Nile die there around uh, uh, the northern parts of Egypt. And this is the god. They also had a god that was a fish god uh, called Hatmet. He was a fish god. And so you have these gods one at a time, incrementally, God being a, a, a perfect understander of what men worship, right? He was, he was uh, targeting the gods of Egypt. The second plague was frogs. We just talked about that, where he tells Pharaoh, tell me what time you want me to lift the frogs, and I'll have God, I'll ask the Lord to do it at that time. The second plague is frogs, and you say, certainly they didn't worship a frog god. Well, of course they did, or else God wouldn't have brought the frogs. 
All of these, the lice, the frogs, the boils, the locusts, the killing of the livestock, all of these plagues attach very, very strictly and clearly to a false Egyptian satanic god. Uh, there was a god in Egypt named Hecht, and he was a frog-headed fertility goddess. You can look all these names up. Hecht, a frog-headed fertility goddess. By bringing the frogs, God was saying, I'm in control of all living things. If I want to bring frogs, I bring frogs. If I want to bring a multitude of frogs that enters every house in Egypt, watch me do it. And where is your God, Hecht, who's supposed to be in charge of these things? Why can't he stop me? Because he doesn't exist. Only I exist. Egypt, listen to what I'm doing. Watch what I'm doing. Learn from what I'm doing. Why don't you turn to me? He's giving them ten reasons to turn to him, to worship him as the one true God. I hope that some of, I know some of them did because there was a, a rabble, there was a group of Gentiles that went out with Israel uh, when Israel left. We know that from the scripture. It wasn't just Jews that left Israel. There was a, a grouping of Gentiles that left Egypt with them. I pray some of them through these plagues understood it's the Israeli God that's true. It's the Israeli God that is the real God. We need to bow down and worship Him. The fifth, plague, uh, the fifth plague was the death of livestock. And there was a God, Hathor, who was a cow-headed love goddess. He was the goddess of love. Uh, cow, I don't know if this is male or female, Hathor, but it was the cow-headed, oh, goddess, female, the cow-headed goddess of love. Very directed to execute judgment on the false gods that Satan had presented to Egypt that they'd been worshiping for a thousand years. The sixth plague was boils. And you say, what does that have to do with Satan? Satan had raised up a god in Egypt. His name was Imhotep, and he was the god of healing. So God says to the Egyptians, I bring this illness on you. Where is your god of healing? Why aren't you calling on your god Imhotep? And why isn't he answering on this day? Who is supreme? I am, Yahweh. Uh, and they couldn't answer. It, it reminds me so much of, uh, of Elijah on Mount Carmel and the, the Baal gods uh, or the Baal worshipers and all his people trying to conjure up Baal and get Baal to come and bring the fire. And, uh, and uh, finally, uh, the, um, was it Elijah said, maybe Baal is asleep. Maybe he's using the bathroom right now. Maybe he's relieving himself to add just a little bit of insult to injury, trying to show them your gods are nothing. The eighth plague was locusts, and there was an Egyptian god that the Egyptians were, work, uh, were worshiping, Senechem, and he was a locust-headed, had the head of a locust, god of the harvest. What did God send the locust to eat? The harvest. The locusts cleared out the fields of, is of Egypt. Even the wise men of Egypt, by the time we get to these last plagues, even the sorcerers and the wise men of Egypt came to Pharaoh and told him, Don't you see? Our nation is destroyed by this God. Let the Israelites go worship their God. He is stronger than ours. He's killing everything that we have. But Pharaoh wouldn't, wouldn't listen. They worshiped a locust-headed God of the harvest. So while God, Yahweh, brings the locust to, is, to Egypt, uh, he would taunt the Egyptians by saying, where is your God of the harvest that you worship? Why isn't he protecting your crops and your fields? You see, he's wreaking havoc. He's taking, uh, he's Xing out one at a time all of these false gods to let Egypt know they don't exist. The ninth plague was darkness. Remember it says he brought a darkness that was so thick you could touch it, the Bible says. And uh, what would that be against? I should have asked before I showed it. The darkness was against the God of the sun. Their chief God. Their Zeus, if you will. amun Re was their chief God. The top of the heap. He was the God of the sun or the sun God. Amun Re. And so when God brings darkness, the question to the Egyptian is, where is your sun God now? Where is this God that provides all this light and energy and heat and all the rest? Where is your God now who is supreme 
except for Yahweh. There is no God like Yahweh. He told Pharaoh, I'm going to do these things that you may know that there is no one like Yahweh, our God, the God of Israel. And one more, the tenth one, and we, we close here. The tenth plague was the death of the firstborn child in Egypt. Remember, this is the great story of the Passover where God instructed everybody, the Egyptians and the Israelites, that I'm going to send this death angel through the camp. He's going to kill all the firstborn in Egypt. But you, Israel, if you will take a lamb, a, a, a male lamb, a year old, inspect him for four days for blemishes. On the fourth day, kill the lamb, take its blood with hyssop and put blood on the doorposts and the lentils. On this night, when I come in with my death angel, on this night, I will pass over all the Israeli houses where I see the blood. That's the situation. Exodus chapter 12, it's the Passover story. But why was God killing the firstborn? Was he just angry? Is he a murderous God? Or was there a reason for it that he chose to kill firstborn sons? There were gods in Egypt. Isis was the protector of children. But there was another god in Egypt that Yahweh was attacking here, and that was Pharaoh himself. You may not know it or you may not remember it, but in Egypt, Pharaoh was worshipped as a god. Pharaoh himself. And so Pharaoh's son would also have been worshipped as a god. So here we see God not only going against Isis, who's supposed to be able to protect our children, but also going against Pharaoh and Pharaoh's sons, who were believed to be the children of the chief god, the sun god Amun-Re. So not only is he attacking gods, but he's attacking their god that they worship on earth, the one they think is God, uh, this man, Pharaoh. And when God takes Pharaoh's son, also supposed to be the son of the, of the sun god, Amun-Re, he is showing absolute superiority over everything that Egypt worships. Next time on Wednesday, I'm going to go through a similar uh, pattern, but we're going to see Yahweh versus the Canaanite gods of Satan. As, eat, as, Yah, as Israel leaves Egypt and goes into the land of Canaan, the next historical movement that Egypt will make, we see Satan right there ready at the border of Canaan with all, a new set of false gods. By different names, they have Canaanite names, Philistine names. We have different names of the gods, but many there's a God of healing, there's a God of fertility, there's a God of love, there's a God of the harvest, there's a God of the sun, because Satan only has so many counterfeits, he has to rehash them over and over. He simply changed the names, changes the names of these gods. And we will see Yahweh go into Canaan and battle against the gods of Canaan, the satanic gods who are vying for the worship of the Jewish souls. God wants Israel to worship Him. And Satan offers all these counterfeits. Worship me instead. Worship all these counterfeit things. Take your eyes off of worship of Yahweh and worship me instead. And here we see in this session tonight that God was supreme, Yahweh, supreme over all the Egyptian gods in the ten plagues of Israel. Yahweh alone is God. That's the point of all of this, that in the book of Isaiah, God says, I am Yahweh, I am the Lord, I am God, and I know of no other. That's why we're jumping off into this, because there is no other God, and God makes sure that we know it. And you can see over and over in the patterns uh, that I'll show you that, yes, Yahweh proved He's the only God there. Yahweh will prove that He's the only God against the Canaanites. Yahweh will prove that He's the only God against the Assyrians. He does it over and over through the history of Israel in the Old Testament. He proves over and over through these stories, through the, these accounts, that He is the only God. And all the rest are satanic counterfeits. <sighs> No, ISIS actually means something. ISIS, uh, I'll, I'll answer it in just a second. Let's close in prayer.